From WLWT, this is Issues. Hello, welcome to Issues. I'm Jan Michelle Lemon Kearney of Sesh Communications and the Cincinnati Herald. We're gonna do a special show today about some medical information that you really need. Um, one of the things we're gonna talk about has to do with a certain bacteria that you might have had since childhood and that could affect you later and we're gonna hear about that, very important to know about. So, and then we have lots of other topics to talk about too. So let me introduce you to people you already know, Dr. Keith Hollywood Melvin, so excited that you're here, internist with Mercy Health, and Dr. Ahmad Attar, who is in gastro, a gastroenterologist with Mercy Health and TriHealth. And both of you have been on you know, so many times before with such good information. I love the fact that you can break down complicated medical information so that we all get it, understand what you're talking about, and then know what mm -hmm. we need to do next. So yes. welcome both of you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. So we have a few things we're gonna talk about. You know we're gonna have to talk about colonoscopies later, a topic that people want to avoid, <laughs> and we're gonna tell them all the reasons why they shouldn't avoid it and why people are making too much of a big deal over nothing, right? But first, let's start talking about, let's see if I get this right, helicobacter, pylori. It's a bacteria that we might have even had since childhood that could, you know, might even be linked to stomach cancer, but tell us all about that. Helicobacter pylori is a bacteria that sometimes we contract by eating contaminated food or the food that processed by somebody who uh, cooking and not cleaning their hands. And that bacteria sits in the wall of the stomach, very often causes no symptoms. People may not know about so it. So we might have had it forever and we just don't know. We don't know we have it. Correct, correct, correct. In fact, we often do endoscopy. We do not see any evidence of uh, any inflammation or any gastritis. We take biopsy, we see the bacteria. The danger of that bacteria is that it sits in the stomach, causes no problem, and then all of a sudden it starts acting up. People may get a gastric ulcer, duodenal ulcer, gastritis, lymphoma, which is a form of cancer in the stomach, and also adenocarcinoma, which is another cancer of the stomach. So the bacteria in the stomach, it really is not benign condition, it's dangerous. It can cause ulcer, and all the complications also, which is bleeding, obstruction, perforation, etc., and can lead to a cancer. For that reason, everybody who have an endoscopy should be screened for that bacteria. And anybody has symptoms of some distress in the stomach, like nausea or vomiting or abdominal pain, should be screened for that bacteria. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, let's, let me go back. Let me kind of summarize. So, and I mentioned that sometimes we get the, it seems to be common to get it in childhood. It seems like we, we really aren't sure how we get it, but maybe in childhood because often it has to do with fecal matter, you know, people not washing their hands, kids, or, you know, saliva kids tend to do whatever, and, um, but you know, adults as well, right? And so right. we can get it kind of, it looks like it might be transmitted person to person. You might live with someone who has it, you don't know they have it. Um, often Correct. people who live in crowded conditions, you mentioned nursing homes. No. Nursing home, common. and group homes, um, things like that, yes, it, uh, you see it more often. Or where people don't have homes. clean water, maybe there's an issue. Not clean water right. and don't you know, clean their food. People don't clean their hands after they eat. And, right. And they process the food, they cook it. It's, it, it's a contamination happened by transmission from one to another. Right, and, and we, don't, we don't know about it. So we, we could know. have it for years, we could have it forever and not have any symptoms. That's right. But then some of the symptoms are what? You're saying kind of nausea, but how do we know it's just like, oh, we, you know, like you might have eaten something that didn't agree with right. you versus now you've got this. It may cause no symptom whatsoever. Right. Or it can cause symptoms that are very vague. You may have just nausea, you feel sick in your stomach, you may have discomfort, uh, you may have pain and um, occasionally the symptom is the ulcer that caused by the bacteria. And that includes very severe pain, sometimes include uh, issues with the, you know, with, the, with the bleeding and things like that. Okay. Yeah, that's how the ulcer look like, that's caused by the bacteria. Yes. Okay, and so, um, so what do we do when we, when, when do we say it's time to see a doctor? If you have pain, if you have nausea, if you have bombing, if you have distress, indigestions, stomach upset, you, you don't, doesn't feel right when you eat, you need to see the physician so you can investigate for that bacteria. If you're losing weight, your appetite is down, 
you don't feel right, you're anemic, you should see the doctor to look into it and find out because bacteria can cause gassy cancer. Gassy cancer can cause loss of appetite, weight reduction, anemia, etc. So when symptoms such as this happen, you must see the physician to look into it. Don't you. mess around. Go, go, just go and call your doctor. And I should say, just for the bacteria, isn't it treatable with, with um, antibiotics? Yes, it is. And actually, it's very treatable, recoverable. And you know, these several regimen of combination antibiotic that we give to cure the bacteria. And by doing so, you prevent cancer, lymphoma, ulcers, etc. So really, it's an easy condition to treat. The only problem with it, it does have tendency to come back. It's what I normally do when oh, we it diagnose. Comes back? Oh. It can reoccur. It can reoccur about 30% of the time. So if someone has a bacteria, we treat them. And after that, we wait a month. We do testing to make sure it's gone away. These two tests, one is called a breath test. We can find out from the breathing if the bacteria has gone away. Oh, really? That's easy. Right? Yeah. Or a stool test, which is also simple. Okay. And then, you know, 95% of the time, it, it does go away. 5% okay. you may have to have a second regimen. Okay, and Dr. Melvin's laughing, so what, what's the private joke? <laughs> no, I was just thinking about it, and uh, you know, many people have that, and a lot of people don't want to take the regimen of antibiotics, and so I was gonna ask Dr. Tarr to say what those antibiotics are, because people have come in with me and they don't want to finish the antibiotics, and we as physicians, uh, try to stress the importance of completing the regimen. Right. The regimen is Don't not that stop. when you feel yeah. better, you can stop and save them for later if you get trouble again. Oh, no. The regimen is designed for you to have a certain number of days and a certain amount of medication to completely eradicate the bacteria. Right. So, but Dr. Tarr could maybe speak to what the names of those are because I know there's some folks listening that still have some in their closet because they didn't complete the regimen okay, that tell was prescribed. Us. Okay, you know, the problem we have here in the Michelle, this bacteria is so stubborn <laughs> and sometimes it's not easy to eliminate. So it will take several antibiotics regimen together for two weeks. And people do not want to take medication for two weeks. Because they feel better. Hey, I feel better. I'll save it for later. Uh, right. That is a crazy idea. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Yeah, don't no, do that. They must finish the regimen as designed. And right. the problem is some side effects from the medication. So we have the first combination of Medication is a flagell, which is uh, for the bacteria, for other conditions we have in GI tract, and another medication called biaxin and beptobesmol. This combination works very well 95% of the time. Okay. Probably when people either do not want to take it for two weeks or they get side effect, they stop taking it. You're right, don't do that. And that's with any medication. Okay, <laughs> right. we're going to come back because we're going to talk about some other things that might be bothering you. Stick with us, really important information. Be right back. Welcome back. We've been talking about Helicobacter pylori. A bacteria you might have had since childhood, you might get later in life, you might not even know you have it, but it can cause serious problems, but it's so treatable with, with antibiotics. And so uh, Dr. Tara just gave us a nice rundown about that. Um, and then Dr. Melvin was mentioning, you know, when people start talking about having these like stomach ulcers and you know nausea and all that, it might be something else, right? And especially yes. during times, you know, like the holidays or special occasions or whatever, when people are eating a lot, eating more than usual, drinking more than usual. Tell us about that. Well, people are complaining of uh, indigestion and heartburn. And then, of course, everyone's got this reflux disease, this gastroesophageal reflux where they're belching and it, uh, they lay down at night after eating uh, cheese conies and pizza <laughs> late at night, they're laying down flat in the bed, one pillow, and then the stuff comes back up. And so that's the gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, that people have called it. And that is a problem that people have on a regular basis. And uh, Dr. Tarr can speak to the, uh, the danger of it or the significance of gastroesophageal reflux disease. 
and then maybe more importantly, the medicines that we use, and then how long you can be taking the medicines, because there are controversies all the time about the protonics and the Prevacid and the medications that we're taking as to how long you can do it. And we see Nexium, the purple pill, all the time, and people are taking them on a regular basis. The question you say is, how long can I continue to take it? And I try to tell people that sometimes these are for symptomatic days. If you're not having any problem with reflux for the past couple of weeks, you don't have to keep taking the medication. So it's important, I think, in all cases to ask your physician, how long do I take this this medicine? Like, and, and they might say, you just keep taking it and, until the physician says stop, and they might say it's two weeks or 10 days, but people need to know, and they should not try to um, decide for themselves sure. how long they should take Medicaid. But tell us about this reflux issue. Well, the reflux happen because the connection between the stomach and the esophagus is loose. This is sphincter, which is a muscle, rounded muscle. That muscle is always closed to prevent acid from going up into the esophagus. It open when you eat to allow the food to go down and then it close right away after that. That sphincter, that muscle, a little bit loose. As a result of that, the acid regurge up into the esophagus. Ah. It reflects into the esophagus and cause some burning and discomfort and digestion. Sometimes can cause chest pain. In fact, right, we so have people patients, feel like yes. they're having heart attacks. Oh, yeah. right. 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 In fact, we have a lot of patients, we thought they have heart attack, they end up not have a heart attack, they come to see me. We diagnose them with esophagitis, and, which is a consequence from gastroesophageal reflux disease. So That's pretty scary. It, it is. It is sometimes. But, but it's a treatable. A treatable. Normally, we give the PPI uh, class of medication, and we have Protonix, Nexium, Prevacid, uh, and Asifix in the market. And the new one is Dexalent, which is an excellent medication. The problem with taking that medication for a long term is not without side effect. So the people who have gastroesophageal reflux disease, the three category of patient. Category one, is they call PPI dependent. They take the medication, we stop them, they get back symptom again. With the medication, we stop them, they cannot do without. The second group of patients are on-demand therapy, which is, um, they do well, like Dr. Meba mentioned, go two, three weeks, the medication stop. They do well for a few months, and then they need medication here and there. They take it as needed. Okay. So they probably, you know, maybe once, twice a month, that should not be any concern about side effects. Okay. The third group of patients who need uh, episodic treatment, of course, for a month or so, and then stop it, and symptoms go away, it come back, another month or so, of course. We would try the best that we can to avoid long-term treatment. This is no longer really preferable nowadays, only because side effects that we know about these medications. Okay. You know, surely there are some other things that we could do surgically to, to correct the problem. We try to avoid surgical intervention because the results are not always guaranteed. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, and is the gastro reflux, is that dangerous at all? Or is it just uncomfortable or can no, it really it, be dangerous? It, no, it can be dangerous actually. Um, the reflux can cause a condition called Barrett esophagus. Dr. Barrett is an Austrian physician back in 1965. He found that the lining of the esophagus is altered and changes from the acid irritation. Mm -hmm. So that lining would changes and altered by the irritation of the acid. It can it grow cancer in it. So Dr. Barrett discover that condition, so they call it Barrett esophagus. Okay. So Barrett esophagus is a complication of acid reflux that can lead to a cancer. So you don't want that acid going back up? I you mean don't that want that to go up, and these people should be actually monitored, and they do have Barrett esophagus. You know, we have a new technology now that we can eliminate it by doing radiofrequency ablation to prevent cancer of the esophagus. Okay, good. So reflux can cause cancer of the esophagus through Barrett esophagus. It can also cause strictures scar tissue. People, when they eat, the food gets stuck. They cannot swallow, so we have to dilate them. Surely, it does some complication, but the most uh, feared complication is buried esophagus because of the cancer. Okay, and then we also might want to just caution people who have those conditions not to overeat and overdrink because it exacerbates that situation, right? No question. The alcohol and caffeine it loosen the sphincter, so make the reflux worse. Okay. If it's already loose, it gets looser. Okay. And there's no question, alcohol it can also damage the esophagus, increase the esophageal cancer. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, Dr. Melvin, we're going to come back. Hold on. Hold that yeah. thought, please. We're going to come back, and we're going to also talk about colonoscopies, 
not a big deal, okay? You guys, don't sweat it. We're gonna talk about that. Dr. Melvin just had one, okay? We'll be right back in a moment. So I'm here talking with Dr. Keith Hollywood Melvin and Dr. Ahmad Attar about some issues, you know, that we really, really have to talk about, okay? We're going to jump right into colonoscopies and preventing colon cancer because this is so preventable and it's so important. And Dr. Melvin just had another colonoscopy. How was it? Uh, it and was, I should say it was done by Dr. Attar. By, right. Yes, it right. was done by Dr. Attar. I just had it done uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, and the truth is, I was supposed to come back in five years, but uh, I had been doing the same thing that other people do. I procrastinated and I put it off, and Dr. Attar called me several times and sent me several letters. Because Dr. Attar will not let you off the hook. Well, he doesn't right. let you off the hook. And, <laughs> and I love and, that. And thank God he yeah. does not, because I don't need to be let off the hook. I, right. might, be, I might be off the hook, right. but he shouldn't let me off. Right. But so I went just the other day and I had the colonoscopy done. I had the simple prep with the two bottles and uh, you prep yourself, you don't eat the day before and I prep myself that evening after work and then at five o'clock in the morning I drank the second bottle and I drank uh, four, five, six <coughs> cups of water and so forth. Yeah, it really, and then it, it cleaned over. you out. It cleaned, it cleaned you out, out so your colon's totally, I was and there actually nine, it feels good. It feels, I was there I think at 9.30 in the morning and by actually 11.30 uh, I was awake and uh, heading out the door. And I had a great anesthetic, uh, the, the, the best one that we have now that Dr. Tar and the anesthesiologist used. Uh, and I actually felt good, no residual. And in fact, a few hours later, I did a present, an hour and a half presentation right. uh, at the Halibration uh, uh, program. Right. So it was very good. And the good thing, Jan, is at this time, this was my fourth colonoscopy over the past 15 years, it, that I no longer have any polyps and uh, both the upper endoscopy and the colonoscopy were both normal That's actually fantastic. for the first time. Right. So I feel really good and I thank Dr. Attar for that. You're now right. I can go ahead and enjoy the holidays. Right. <laughs> and yeah, you know the thing is that people get really nervous about colonoscopies. They don't hurt, you don't feel a thing, you're asleep and then with this, you know, with the anesthesia and it's the kind that you go to sleep during the uh, during the session and then you wake right back up. I yes. mean it's so simple. Very simple. Really very simple. You feel nothing. You feel nothing, be yeah. Useful, simple procedure and the inconvenience of getting ready for the procedure, it's surely worth going through it because right. it prevents you from colon cancer. Right. And the colonoscopy it should be done in everybody at age 50. Age 50, right. okay. But Starting now, at age 50, yeah. At age 50. By now, there are a lot of studies trying to push the age down to 45 okay. and even possibly 40. I have two young ladies at 34 years of age, both of them, they have colon cancer. Okay. And we cure them. So colonoscopy is really mandatory for everybody in that age group. I think we're going to start at 45 and everybody across the board. I like that, right. And yes. I would think if, if you have a family history, you might go, go earlier. Like family maybe those you go 10 ladies. years younger. Yeah. If you have family history, you go 10 years younger. And right. the risk of colon cancer is higher if someone has history in the family of colon cancer or colon polyp or even other cancer like breast cancer, uterus cancer, and ovarian cancer increase risk of colon cancer. These are a family of cancer, they relate to each other. Right. So you have that, the risk of the others, you should be screened. Right. So, and it's so easy. I mean, you know, and I was, you know, we have to tell Dr. Melvin's story that you actually um, found your, um, what, what, was it prostate, prostate can cancer? You found your prostate cancer yourself, and so, and, and got cured from that. And so, um, and I don't know, is that related to colon cancer at all, or just? There are some studies show there could be some relation, okay. not as tight relation as the breast and ovary and uterus. But okay. there are some study recently, as a matter of fact, I was reading an article, it does increase the colon cancer risk, yeah. Okay. But this isolated report here and there, yeah. Okay. I, I think the important, uh, the, the caveat to note is that if you're 35 or 40 or whatever, if you're having a change in your bowel habits, if you got uh, starting to have constipation or something different about it, 
certainly if you see some blood, sure it could be hemorrhoids when you see bright red blood mm -hmm. uh, on the tissue or something, but if you have a persistent problem and you're changed in your bowel habits and so forth, I think you need to see your doctor and then we can refer you from the primary care perspective of the nurse practitioner to the gastroenterologist, but I just, uh, the, the, the lesson and the warning is that you should not allow symptoms to continue to persist. Right. And you know, even the even, uh, year before last, Jan, and Dr. Tarr probably knows, uh, the young lady who's a police officer here, I had just had a baby and so she was going to the doctors and she kept saying, I'm just having trouble with my, something's not right about my bowel, and they finally, did a colonoscopy and at 33 years of age, she had colon cancer. Yes. And so the, the, the lesson there was that I was glad that she persisted right. in pushing the doctor about her symptoms. Right. And the one thing I say as a physician is, what is the sweat off of my back to s refer you to the gastroenterologist? Right. If I'm not exactly sure, I say all the time, my patients are guessing what's wrong with them. When they come to me, they come to me to tell them exactly what's wrong. Right. If I'm not sure, and I refer them to the specialist in that particular area. Right, and Dr. Tar will take good care. Dr. Tar, because of you, I went to Dr. Tar. Yes. And you know, you found a polyp, you got rid of it. I went back, polyp free, wonderful. It's great to know, mm -hmm. and I'll be back again in um, whatever that three year span is. So, you know, it's great, and it's easy and simple. You know, Dr. Melvin and I can both tell you it's no big deal, so important. And Jeff is saying, let's get phone numbers, okay? <laughs> so, whose number's coming up first? Okay, let's see. Well, Dr. Melvin, just give us your number. We'll see what comes up. All right, there we are. Yeah, that's, there you go. Give us your number. 585-9500. That's Mercy Avondale, located at 2135 Dana Avenue, right in the heart of Evanston. That's right, 585-9500. <laughs> okay, and Dr. Attar, give us your number. It's 513-791-8882. Uh, One more time. It's 513-791-8882. Gastroenterology consultants in um, uh, Montgomery Road, Bethesda North Campus. Very good. Two fantastic physicians. Thank you so much. You've got life-saving you. information. Okay, be proactive. Take care of yourself. We'll be right back with some, some events for you. great events and to Michael will be back soon. I'm going to go ahead and, and do her part right now. Okay, so uh, the African American Chamber is having a networking exchange with Vice Mayor Christopher Smitherman Thursday, December 20th, 530 at Mardi Gras in Madison, best catfish in town. And right before that, Patrice Boffman Borders is going to talk about emotional intelligence at 4 p.m. also at Mardi Gras. You can just stay for the exchange. So go ahead and call the African American Chamber at 513-751-9900. Saturday, December 22nd, we are going to have a chamber music workshop, and that's at Hilltop Plaza in Mount Healthy. I'm sorry, it's an ornament making workshop. Okay, I don't have my glasses on. It's an ornament making workshop. Hilltop Plaza in Mount Healthy, 8120 Hamilton Avenue. For more information, call 521-3111, and I think that's sponsored by Playtime USA. That's gonna be a really fun, fun event. All right, so I think that's it for now. We want you to have a great week. Stay safe and stay positive.